One of the most interesting and important battles in Star Trek history is the one portrayed in the old series episode, Balance of Terror. Balance of Terror was like the third Star Trek I'd ever seen, and the very first to really portray a battle in Star Trek. This episode is very important as an episode, but also for the lore of Star Trek. It tells the story of a battle that had to be fought and won in order to prevent a war with the Romulan Star Empire. So we're going to break down both the out-of-universe and in-universe lore and tactics behind this important battle between the Enterprise and the Romulan Warbird. First about this episode itself. I have to first tell you that this episode is heavily inspired by the old classic 1950s naval movie, The Enemy Below, which is about a battle between an American destroyer and a German U-boat. It's an excellent movie which goes in depth about naval tactics, the thinking and strategy of each commander, and the will and guts of both sides. I highly recommend watching it if you have a free evening or afternoon. Now there are some elements of the movie that are almost direct copies in the Star Trek episode, however after rewatching both side by side, I can't dismiss the innovative manner in which the writers really integrate real live naval tactics into Star Trek. And even to this day, there are only a few Star Trek movies or episodes that really match the deep thinking and attention to strategy as seen in this episode. Before getting into the battle, let's look at both of the contenders. Now neither side had contact for a hundred years. The last contact was the ending of a bloody war between Earth and her allies and the Romulan Star Empire. As you can see on this map, the treaty that ended the war established a neutral zone. Any incursion by either side into the neutral zone would be considered an act of war. Each side maintains a number of outposts along the borders of the zone to keep an eye on the other side. Now in the last 100 years, Earth and her allies have united and formed the United Federation of Planets. This is largely the result of the Romulan War, which although devastating, in the end served to create a powerful interstellar entity a power that expands rapidly and often comes in odds with martial civilizations such as the Klingons. Based on what we know from the last season and the best season of Star Trek Enterprise, the Romulans pulled strings behind the scenes to weaken Earth and others, certainly a prelude to Romulan military aggression. Clearly the Romulans know a great deal more about Earth and her allies than Earth knows about the Romulans. Spock declares in this episode that the Federation still doesn't know what the Romulans look like. While the Federation continued to grow after the war, it is not known what the Romulans were up to, but based on the Romulan commander's reference to all the battles and campaigns he's fought with his comrades, and bringing another war to the Empire, I'm sure it's safe to say that the Romulans have been busy. More than likely, while the Federation has been expanding through diplomacy, the Romulans have been doing the same through conquest. By the time of this episode, the Romulans are confident and brazen, which tells us they've been rather successful in their various military campaigns, and finally feel ready to risk testing their old adversaries, the people of Earth, and the Federation. But the Romulans, although aggressive, aren't stupid. They decide to send one ship, and one ship only. So why did they send them one ship instead of everything? Well, the Romulans are not willing to commit to a full-scale war without first testing Starfleet's resolve and tactical abilities. If this one ship was successful in its mission by defeating Starfleet's defenses, or seeing that they're afraid of Romulan weapons, then they can prepare for another war with the Federation. If this one ship loses the battle, the Empire can then claim the Romulan commander was not acting under orders and is renegade or rogue. They know the Federation would rather not go to war over just this one incursion, and the Romulans will have learned a great deal about the Federation's military capabilities, no matter the outcome. Phew, so that's a lot of setup for the contenders, so let's go into what happens. The Enterprise is on its way to the neutral zone because the outposts watching it are going dark one by one, for mysterious reasons. Finally, Outpost 4 manages to get a distress call out. I find it interesting that Outpost 4 was the only outpost that managed to get the call out, indicating that some sort of jamming may have taken place. The Romulans seem to have deliberately allowed Outpost 4 to get its call out, perhaps to see what Starfleet's response will be. Even though the Enterprise is at maximum warp, 
Just before reaching phaser range, the Romulans decloak and finish off Outpost 4 to everyone's shock with a powerful plasma weapon and then recloaks. Again, this is all testing. The Romulans now know the maximum speed of the Enterprise. I must note that all this time, both Kirk and Spock are genuinely caught off guard by the cloaking device, as if they'd never seen this kind of technology before. Although motion sensors do track something out there, perhaps a distortion, which they call a blip, the Enterprise cannot get an exact fix on the Romulan ship while it's cloaked. And then the Romulan ship very leisurely turns back in the direction of the neutral zone. Again, very obvious, as if letting everyone know, yes, we are Romulans, we are here, come play with us. Now Kirk believes that the cloaking device may work both ways, preventing the Romulans from seeing them as well, leaving only special sensors capable of seeing the Enterprise while cloaked. And he may not be wrong in that. After all, if the photons are bending around the Romulan ship to create a true cloaking device, the cloak would work both ways. So Kirk decides to order a parallel course, matching the exact speed and course of the Romulan in an attempt to look like an echo or a sensor ghost. This is actually a direct allusion from the movie The Enemy Below, where the American destroyer captain does the same thing when tracking the German U-boat. At this point, someone on the Romulan ship makes a serious mistake. Subspace radio silence is broken, and they send a visual message back to Romulus reporting of their glorious mission. Uhura and Spock are able to intercept this message, and finally, after a century, the appearance of the Romulans is revealed, and they are Vulcanoid. Apparently, at some point in the past, a Vulcan splinter colony formed the Romulan Star Empire. This erases one of the Romulans' great advantages. After all, it is much harder to find an unknown enemy than a familiar one. The Romulans then decloak and make some maneuvers. We're not clear why, but there is some talk of saving power. But the Romulan commander is not fooled by the reflection that follows them. Why would he be? Kirk has underestimated the Romulans, who are still just toying with them at this point. The Romulan ship recloaks and occasionally turns to see if there's any change to the sensor Echo. After the shock of the discovery about the Romulans' origins wears off, both sides are considering all the information they have gathered, and the Enterprise is finally able to make a tactical assessment. Let's line these ships up side by side. The Constitution class. Armed with phasers, which are accurate and energy efficient, and photon torpedoes, which are not actually used in this episode, but will be a few episodes later. I believe the torpedoes may have been too imprecise to track a cloaked ship. The Constitution class has an extremely powerful matter-antimatter warp drive, shields and deflectors. The Romulan Warbird, on the other hand, is designed around their primary weapon, the Plasma Torpedo Launcher. This extremely powerful weapon can reduce the hardest substance known to man to a brittle crust that crumbles under Spock's fingers. The plasma envelops the target and then forces an implosion. The Warbird has a practical invisibility screen making it very difficult to hit, but still possible with accurate sensor readings. Its power source is unknown. Scotty implies that it's simple impulse. I believe he means to say that at least while cloaked, the Romulan ship is only capable of running on impulse power, and that the power supply is finite, a fuel that can be depleted. Of course, there can be no doubt that it has some sort of faster than light travel, or it would have taken it decades or even centuries to even reach the neutral zone. I believe this is further set up for a submarine-like battle. The Enterprise's warp drive is analogous to the diesel engine of a World War II destroyer, a powerful and fast propulsion system, while the Romulan Warbird's power, when cloaked, is similar to a U-boat's battery power when submerged, limited by charge, and much slower than a diesel engine. And of course the Romulans must decloak to fire their weapons. So we have two very different ships with very different tactical abilities, and this is an excellent matchup in my opinion. After some discussion and assertions by Spock and Lieutenant Stiles that the Romulans are likely to start a war with the Federation if weakness is shown, Kirk decides to fight this battle to prevent a larger conflict. I totally agree with his decision. Sometimes battles or even wars must be fought to prevent larger conflicts. 
The next plot element is fantastic, and perhaps one of the more innovative parts of this battle. The Warbird is changing course for a comet. Kirk sees a chance to attack, knowing the Warbird will leave a visible trail when it goes through the comet's tail, giving the Enterprise a target to shoot at. But it's not what Kirk thinks it is. Kirk in this instance is overly anxious to catch the Romulan before it escapes back into the neutral zone, and didn't stop to think why the Romulan would head for the comet in the first place. The Romulan intends to use the comet as cover to conceal a U-turn back onto the Enterprise where he will suddenly attack. But the Romulan also misjudges Kirk, who capitalizes on speed and swings around to the other side of the comet where he intends to attack when the Romulan comes through the tail. The Romulan commander suddenly realizes Kirk's intent, orders evasive at the last second, but the Enterprise also loses its opportunity to fire at any trail the Romulans have left. Not all is lost for the Enterprise, however. The Enterprise aims with sensors and attacks anyway with phasers. Now I want to say something about the nature of phasers here. Stiles clearly states that the phasers are set to proximity blast. This is pretty much the first time we see their use in space combat. In this special mode, rather than beams, they are fired in bursts and on the receiving end they act a little bit like depth charges. But over the years we've seen in Star Trek all manner of phasers. Some are beams, some are pulses, some are like bolts, and sometimes the same phaser system will fire in two different ways. Phasers, although probably over-engineered, are very sophisticated and versatile weapons. In this case, an expanding phaser burst towards an invisible target would have more chance of hitting or doing some kind of damage. Of course, such a burst would dissipate a bit quicker, limit its range, and would be less potent overall. But this is the appropriate mode needed for hitting a cloaked Romulan ship that isn't easy to lock onto. Anyway, the Enterprise is able to rough up the Romulan warbird enough to cause the Romulan some distress with this less than optimal attack. And then, disaster strikes. As I said, perhaps phasers are a bit over-engineered and aren't intended to operate in this manner. The phasers overload and a control circuit burns out. The timing couldn't be worse. The Romulans decloak and fire on the Enterprise. Just in the nick of time, Kirk orders full astern and to engage emergency warp. The plasma ball follows the Enterprise and begins to overtake her. Now normally I wouldn't think that a plasma ball would be able to make warp speed, but apparently this one can. Either this weapon is working as intended, or it is possible, either by design or by accident, that this plasma torpedo was caught up in the Enterprise's warp field and drug along at warp speed. Luckily, plasma torpedoes lose their potency over time, and by the time the plasma hits, there is a minimal damage to the Enterprise. At this point, the weaknesses of the Romulan Warbird are becoming quite apparent. The Enterprise closes easily again and continues to fire phasers on proximity blast. If there is any sign of the Romulan decloaking, the Enterprise can simply outrun any torpedo attack and or use a phaser blast to attack the torpedo itself. While the Romulan ship has a finite amount of power, it cannot continue to maintain its cloak, but Kirk pursues the Romulan into the neutral zone and continues to attack. The Romulan commander has lost the tactical advantage, and the constant phaser barrage is getting under the Romulan's skin. They must now resort to trickery to get the phasers off of them, and eject a debris field, enough to distract the Enterprise's sensors. They then stop moving. While Spock does realize that this is a trick, he's also lost all sensor contact with the Romulan ship. The Enterprise has lost the Romulans. A waiting game then ensues, for hours. Both sides know the other is still out there. Spock, while working on the phasers, accidentally powers up a sensor on his console and gives away their position. The waiting game is up. The Romulans have regained the advantage and moved towards the Enterprise, still undetected. Kirk is brilliant in this instant and turns their blunder into an advantage. Having already predicted that the Romulans are already moving towards them, he simply reverses course and fires at the Enterprise's previous position to score some hits on the Romulans. But the Romulans have one final trick up their sleeve. They eject more debris, and within the debris field, they sneak in a nuclear mine. The Enterprise detects it at the last minute 
but not before the blast from the weapon hits the Enterprise with loads of gamma radiation, like you'd see from a nuclear blast. This shocks the Enterprise, rendering it helpless for some moments. But this is where the Romulan commander makes his most fatal mistake. He doesn't take the opportunity to finish off the Enterprise. I must comment here that I really prefer the Romulans as opponents to the Klingons. With the Klingons, you mostly know what you're gonna get. The Romulans are far more complex and intellectually intriguing. This Romulan commander is very war-weary, unlike his subordinates. Although he is competent and experienced, whatever the conflicts the Romulans have recently been involved in, this Romulan has clearly endured some personal losses. It's hard to not like this Romulan and actually feel something for his plight. As an audience, we want him to have a fighting chance. But after the Enterprise recovers, the same old game continues. The Romulan subordinates Decius, to his credit, goads his commander into doing the Romulan thing to fulfill his duty and attack again. And here again, we see the flaw in Starfleet weapons. Over-engineering, too many things can go wrong, with Klingon disruptors, they're crude, but you know they're going to work every time. With Romulan Plasma, same deal. It has its limitations, but you don't have to worry about silly things like circuit burnouts and coolant leaks. The phaser control room has been contaminated with a coolant leak, rendering the Enterprise defenseless while the Romulans zero in on their prey. Had it not been for Spock's heroics, who gets the phasers charged up in spite of the leak, the Enterprise would have been destroyed. Now here's a small spoiler about the movie, The Enemy Below. That movie ends with both commanders saving each other's lives from the burning hulks of their respective vessels. In this case, the Romulan commander knows he will be dishonored if he allows himself to live or his vessel to be captured. He acknowledges Kirk's offer for aid declaring that they could have been friends in another life. With no countdown at all, he triggers the warbird to immediately self-destruct. A glorious and honorable death for a true Romulan. This tells me that in many ways the Romulans have an honor and duty code that rivals the Klingons in spite of their reputation for treachery. But in this battle, the Enterprise was at risk of being destroyed on at least three occasions. It could have easily gone the other way. I love how this episode occasionally drops what appears to be unpredictable random plot elements for better or for worse, like the phaser burnout, the coolant leak, and the Romulan commander's war weariness. All of these are unpredictable elements that take place in real combat. No matter how much Sun Tzu one reads, or how good the tacticians are, battles and war is a very messy and unpredictable business. Amazingly, the Enterprise came away with only a single casualty when at times the entire ship was in danger of being destroyed. The Romulans would not start a war that day, but the defeat would later push them to develop their technology further and into a brief alliance with the Klingons. In short, this battle, having prevented a war and spurring the Romulan-Klingon alliance briefly, would have an impact on the quadrant that would last for decades. Thank you for watching Space Friends! Be sure to like and subscribe and comment. Do you think the Romulan commander would have destroyed the Enterprise if he weren't so hesitant? What would have happened if the Romulans had actually won this battle? Also, special thanks to new crewmates on Patreon, the Awkward Screw, and as of now, Jean-Luc Mortel has edited his pledge to a higher amount. YouTube ad revenue is finicky, but donations and Patreon support tell me you want me to keep going, and so I shall. Until next time, Starship Crews.